Thanks. So, um, I mean, I'll start with two postscriptum to yesterday's talk. And so the, the first one is the postscriptum to, um, to Sasha Kusitsov's talk on introduction to derived categories. So, namely, I want to say a few words on the octahedral axiom, which is sort of not so, I mean, most of the time when you work with derived categories, it's not so important. But when you do deal with T structures, it's really crucial. And I mean, any of the ex I don't think you'll be able to do any of the exercises I'll mention today without the, the octahedral axiom. And so, so it has this reputation as being something uh, fairly complicated, which is partly due to, um, due to the name octahedral axiom, which makes it really hard to draw. Because really, it answers a very simple question. So if you have the composition of two morphisms in your triangulated category, then what can you say about the corresponding cones? And the statement is just that these cones live into an in an exact triangle. Right, so there is an exact triangle like this. And, 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 and I mean, then there are many situations where you've already seen this. Say these are morphisms in the ambulant category that are inclusions. Then you just get one of the isomorphism theorems. And the, the second postscriptum is to, to my own talk. Right, so say you have this quiver with um, two vertices and some arrows going like this. And maybe let me start to introduce this notation that um, right, S1 is the simple representation concentrated at the first vertex. And S2 is the simple representation corresponding at the second vertex. And right, so my, my stability condition depended on the choice of two complex numbers in the upper half plane. And so what happens if I, if I degenerate this so that Z2 is now some suddenly in the positive real line, which is not allowed, right? And now, I mean, now this object S2 satisfies the, no longer satisfies this property, right? As Z of S2 is suddenly not in H, right? So, and so to complete this deformation property, what can we do? Well, the idea is now go to the derived category. Namely, if you look at S2 shifted by one, right, which is just, um, means you take the complex that the zero everywhere except it has S2 in degree zero. Here, this is degree minus one. Then Z of this one um, is minus C2, so this is an H. Right, and somehow you want, uh, and so the answer is you try to form an, right, so you try to form an abelian category. Containing um, S2 shifted uh, by one, but also lots of parts still coming from A. Okay, so and so this is a little bit the motivation for um, um, a lot of the construction in my in my talk today. Right, so I mean, even in this quiver case where we already saw that we had strong deformation properties um, of the stability condition, to get an even stronger, better deformation behavior, we need to go to the derived category. Um, in front. Okay, and so really before I want to go, um, really go to the derived category, I want to define, make one more definition purely within abelian categories. Um, 
because there are many of the definitions in the triangulated category will be analog to that one. And this is also something we've already, um, in a way, already seen. So given this abelian category, a pair of subcategories, by subcategory, I always mean a full subcategory. So this is called a torsion pair. If it satisfies the following two conditions, so I'll write, I'll start using this shorthand notation, so I'll write from, of, from t, comma f equal to zero, which means take any object in t, any object in f, then there are no morphisms from t to f, from, from the former object to the second object. Right? And any e in a fits into a short exact sequence. Um, zero goes to t of e, goes to e, goes to f of e goes to zero with t of e in t and f of e in f. And I mean, this should, this should look quite similar to you because it's really a bit like a notion of slope stability with just two slopes, right? Where, where t are the same as tables of big slope and f the same as tables of small slopes. You never have morphisms from stemmer tables of big slope to small slope, and this is somewhat than the, the analog version of the hadron zimmern filtration. And so what are examples? I mean, so where the name comes from is when you take A, the category of coherent chiefs, or modules over a, a ring, and um, T are the torsion sheaves, Every section is annihilated by some element in the structure ring and F are torsion free sheaves. Right? And so I mean this is this property basically holds by definition. Torsion free sheaves are those that don't have torsion subsheaves. And this one follows because every sheaf has a maximal torsion subsheaf and the quotient is torsion free. And of course, there are, I mean, there are ma many variants of this one, right? I could say, say, x is a surface, and I could say t are all the torsion sheaves supported in dimension zero, and then f are all those sheaves that don't have a subsheaf supported in dimension zero. Or I could look at torsion sheaves supported in a given subscheme, any, any, any games like that. So there are many variants of that. Yeah. So, it's, it's autom so it follows from this property that this decomposition is automatically unique and functorial. And there are, there are, there are, there are adjoints to the inclusion functor. So. Right. And let me give another example. Take um, Q reps and then T, we call um, representations. supported at a fixed vertex i. Right, so, I mean, I'll, typically when the quiver has no loop, this is just the extension closure of the simple vertex at um, vertex i. And then what is f? These are um, all the quiver representations so that if I take um, the intersection of all the kernels of maps from I to J, and I mean, I should, now I should really apologize to the notation because here in this notation, right, I'm taking the intersection over all errors starting from I. So I is fixed and um, this part varies. Um, Right, and so um, I'm looking at representations where, in a sense, everything going, the, the representation is injective starting from um, this vector space Vi, right? So here, 
this is, these are all in VI, and if I take the intersection, then I'm presumed to get the zero section. Right, and, and, and similarly, I could take A equal Q rep. I could take um, F equal this part, and then um, T, the corresponding T is an exercise to that. Okay, but then an additional example comes from slope stability. All right, so assume we have, um, assume C is a central charge. On A, with the hadron zimmern property. And now I take a cutoff phase between zero and one. Then I let um, T to be, so let me write this as A um, greater than phi. All right, these are all E in A, so that all Hadron-Zimmern filtration factors have phase bigger than phi. Or I could write it as all the, I mean, say my stables are phase bigger than phi, and then taking the extension closure, I could also say that all the um, E and A, all quotients, E onto B have phase greater than phi. Right, so basically remember my picture was this. I have some filtration of my category into all these pieces of same stables, and now what I'm doing is I'm intentionally making this filtration much coarser, right? So I'm just putting this part over here is a bigger than phi corresponding to my choice of phi, and then correspondingly f is a less than or equal to phi, so all hn factors have phase less than or equal to phi, and then here I also have a corresponding characterization like that by a sub-object, and then the claim is that this is a torsion pair. Right, and I, I won't I won't prove this statement here, but um, um, it's not it's not difficult to prove. And the, the key ingredient is, of course, the hadron zimmern filtration. The hadron zimmern filtration and the home vanishing between um, stable semi-stable sheaves between semi-stable objects. Right, so for example, how do you get the short exact sequence? Well, T of E, well, well, how do you get T of E? Well, you just look at the hadron zimmern filtration. It will start with objects of big slope, and at some point, the phase will stop being from, change from being bigger than phi and less than equal to phi, and the corresponding filtration step there will be your T of E. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, and then the strict inequality on the other, yeah. I have to take strict on one side and non-strict on the other. Okay, so... And now T structures are basically an analog of that for triangulated categories. The definition of T structure 
on a triangulated category. D is a pair um, D greater or equal to zero and D less than or equal to zero of subcategories such that so, um, so if I said D greater or equal than one to be D greater or equal to zero shifted by minus one then this is contained in D greater or equal to zero. Right, so note that there is a, there's always this sign shift here. Just because if you shift the complex by a positive amount, then it, it means shifting the objects into negative degrees. Then there is harm from D less than or equal to zero to D greater or equal to one is equal to zero. And any um, E fits into an exact triangle. Um, e less than the equal to zero goes to E, goes to E, greater or equal to one goes to E. Right, where this, of course, is in here, and this is in here. Right, and the, 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 the main example, of course, is when D is DB of A or the unbounded derived category in A or bounded on one side or the other. And um, you said my D greater or equal to zero are all those E's so that HI of E is zero for I um, less than zero. In other words, the cohomology is only non-zero when I is um, greater or equal than zero. Right, and so maybe, um, right, and, 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 and um, Sasha yesterday explained how to get these truncation functors. And may, maybe just one more comment, right? So if you have an, where does this harm vanishing come from? This is actually not, quite as obvious as it may, it may look like at first. Right? So if you have here something in D less than or equal to zero, then this is a complex that you can basically to be assumed to be zero in positive degrees. And D greater or equal to one, a complex that you can assume to be zero in negative and zero degrees. So why is there no morphism like that? Well, I mean, how do you compute morphisms? For example, you can take an injective resolution of this one, and this will still just be computed, and this will still just be a complex in positive degrees, and then the homomorphisms in the derived category are just morphism of complexes, right? Or similarly, you can take a projective resolution of that one, and then this will still just be a complex concentrated in non-positive uh, non degrees, right? I mean. It is always possible, if you were to do this the other way around, then in the derived category, you can have morphisms like this that induce a zero morphism in cohomology. Right? This is exactly an, um, an a morphism from here to here would exactly be an X2 between these two, two objects. And why is that? I mean, compute an injective resolution, applying the harm that's exactly the same as computing X2. Right, okay, and the, um, I mean the, the, the picture I like to draw is something like this. So you have the um, less than or equal to zero looks like this. The greater or equal to one looks like this. And then if you shift it by one, um, if you undo the shift, then But here I'm in my picture, the shift by one is just shifting everything to the left. And so D, D greater or equal to zero would look something like this. And so there is an intersection between D greater or equal to zero and D less than or equal to zero. And so this is what's called the 
heart of the T structure. Right, and there are um, right, so definition A the intersection of the equator equal to zero with the less than or equal to zero um, is the heart of the T-structure. And the key thing is that this is automatically an abelian category. I mean, what is the exact structure? And a short exact sequence in A is just a sequence of triangle, it's, it's just an exact triangle in D where all the three objects happen to be in the heart. And the, the extreme cases are um, either that A is just um, zero, but then that's called a semi-orthogonal decomposition. Right, in this case, um, D less than or equal to zero and D greater or equal to zero are both um, um, triangulated subcategories because they're closed under shift and extensions. And the other extreme case is that um, right, the union, right, so the, the, this is the case where basically the strip here in the middle is empty. In the other extreme case is that both the top part and the bottom part here is empty. Right, so that the union of um, the greater equal to minus n intersect the less than or equal to n, that this gives you everything. And that's called a, a bounded T structure. And I mean, Tom, Tom Bridgeton's favorite picture for this is always just, um, now the, the category is just a strip and it's filtered by the shifts of your heart. And some of the key lemma is that a bounded T structure is equivalent is always determined by its heart. Right, so it's equivalent to giving um, a full subcategory A of D with the following properties. So one, um, if you have home from A shifted by N to A shifted by M, then this is zero for N is bigger than M, right? So there are no negative X. This is again the, this, this picture that I drew here. If you shift the left hand more down than the right one, then there are no morphisms. And right, that corresponds to, to this property here. And so what corresponds to this property here is that every, um, right, so for every object in my triangulated category, this has a filtration into cohomology sheets. into cohomology objects of, so more precisely, for each E in D, there is a sequence of triangles so starting with zero, E1, so there's a sequence of maps like this, up to EM equal E, and so such that the following holds, right, so for each of these maps, I can complete this to a triangle, and so maybe let's call this A1, this A2. So that AI 
that they are just in the shifted heart for some ki's, and k1 is bigger than k2 is bigger than, and so on up to kn. Right, and so in this in the standard example. Right, these, these AIs are just the um, cohomology objects. And again, I have to do the sign shift H minus KI of E. Right, and, and otherwise, we just define these to be the cohomology objects with respect to our T structure. And I mean, this, right, so I, so I won't proof for you the equivalence, but again, it's, it's not too hard using the, using the octahedral axiom. Right, but, um, I mean, maybe, maybe two more comments on this filtration. So on the one hand, right, even in the standard T structure, thinking of, of this filtration is often quite useful. So for example, I mean, basically, almost every time you see a spectral sequence argument, um, if it's a simple argument, and it can all basically almost always be replaced by an argument using this, um, using this filtration. And the other comment I want to make is that this should now look really similar to the existence of hadron narrow zeman filtrations. Right? There are no harms from object of bigger phase to smaller phase. And this looks a little bit like the existence of hadron narrow zeman filtration. Right, so there is a sequence of maps like this, so that when you compete, when you complete each morphism to a triangle, right, this is the cone of this map here. Then A, this has to be in the shift, in the shift of A. And B, the shifts have to be decreasing. Yeah, so here, this is a triangle, this is a triangle, yeah. So this is a, this dotted arrow is a map from A2 to E1 shifted by 1. Sorry? Not necessary? Sorry, can you say? Yeah. Yeah, so, so if it has these two properties, then it's automatically abelian at the heart of a boundary T structure. I didn't, so let me just. Yes, so, 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 so right, if you, if you take the boundary derived category of A and you take the standard T structure, then the heart is the back, you get back the original category. Right. And I mean, how to go from one way to the other, given your, 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 your T-structure, you get A is the intersection. Um, right, how to go from A to um, your, to your T-structure. So here, for D less than or equal to zero, you have to take the extension closure of A a shifted by one, A shifted by two, and so on. And similar here, right? So, so just as this picture here suggests, so maybe let me draw this over here. So this would be the less than or equal to zero, and this here would be um, the greater or equal to zero. Okay, I mean, so far, So whether the derived category of A is equivalent to the original one, so that's in general not true. Um, there, um, so, so, so there is a functor somewhere if you work with um, DG categories or something like that. Um, otherwise, it's a, it's a bit of a mess to construct a functor. But the, I mean, um, But 
But it, it, there's a more essential obstruction to, right, so the, so the question is whether db of a is isomorphic to d. And so the bigger obstruction is that um, in here, any x n, right, so if you have e and f in a, then any morphism to e, right, so harms like this, this is xn from e to f, then an abelian category xn can always be written as a, as a composition of x1s. I say an x2 corresponds to four-term short x sequence, and the corresponding short-term short x sequences give you two x1s. And this may not be true over here. Right, so this, this xn must be x1 generated, and then if that's true, then basically under reasonable assumption, this is an equivalence. Okay, so that, that doesn't necessarily. Okay, so how to, how to construct T-structures? Well, some of the main tools for constructing T-structures on derived categories of co coherent sheaves is the following proposition. Right, so let MT comma F be a torsion pair in an abelian category. Then the following defines a defines a T structure. So D um, sharp greater or equal to zero. These are all the E's such that um, um, HI of E is equal to zero for I less than minus one and H minus one of E is an F. Um, D sharp I guess I shouldn't write here because some people can't see. D sharp um, less than or equal to zero. These are all the E's such that H I of E is equal to zero for I bigger than zero and H zero of E is in T. And so for completeness, the corresponding heart, the intersection of these two, these are all the E's such that, such that H0 of E is in T, H minus 1 of E is in F, and HI of E is equal to 0 otherwise. Right, and so um, you can really think of this as the category of two term complexes. So any such E is isomorphic to a two-term complex where the kernel of D is in F and the co-kernel of D is in T. Right, so the description of objects is really concrete. Just note that the, the description of morphism is a little bit more is a little bit more, more subtle, right? Because we are really looking at morphisms in the derived category, not just morphism between um, ordinary morphisms between complexes. Right, and what is the um, let me also draw a picture for that one, right? So we have here the picture of our original T structure where here we have A and A shifted by 1, A shifted by minus 1. And right, so this is some of filtration of the of the derived category. And now we also have the filtration of A into just two pieces. So where um, T are those, we think of those as objects with bigger phase and F. Similarly here we have T shifted by one and F shifted by one. Right, and so my new heart is 
Come on here. This is my A sharp. It's the extension closure of T and F shifted by one. Okay, any, any, any questions on this? Right, and, and I mean, I should say that um, this works similarly. Right, so I stated this inside the bounded derived category. Uh, right, so here I stated this as a, as a T structure in DB of A. Um, but this works similarly just assuming that that A is the heart of a bounded T structure in D. And sorry here, I also wanted to insist that this this gives me a bounded T structure. And le le let, me, let me leave the proof as an exercise. Right, and so basically here I'm taking this heart and I'm, I, I'm, I'm tilting it, although uh, unfortunately it would be a lie to claim that the name tilting comes from this picture over here. Right, and so in particular this, this lets you give I mean, each of the example of torsion pairs now lets you construct a new case of a bounded T structure on a, a triangulated category. But also you can iterate this construction, right, by using this remark. You start with the bounded derived category of A, you tilt it, you get a new heart. If you find a new torsion pair in this new abelian category, then you can keep going. Okay, and so now, I mean, a stability condition basically just puts these two notions together. The notion of a um, heart of a bounded T structure and the notion of um, slope stability in this abelian category. A free stability condition. on a, a triangulated category D is a pair sigma equals Z comma A where A in D is the heart of a bounded T structure And um, Z is a morphism from the group homomorphism from the K group of A, which is the same as the K group of D, to C. Group homomorphism that, that satisfies these two properties that I discussed last time, right? So that yesterday, so that if I have a non zero object, then Z of E is in this semi-closed upper half plane. And secondly, that Z has the hardenau zimmern property. So every object has a hardenau zimmern filtration with respect to Z. Right, and, and the way you should think of this is that, right, so, I have my filtration of my derived category given my, by my bounded T structure. And now each of these pieces is filtered even more finely 
using slope stability, using slope stability um, for for this for this abelian category, right? Of course, I can shift this to get a similar filtration of A shifted by one. And I somehow all these is hold together via the central charge that somehow organizes the, um, the these phases to lie in the complex plane. And somehow that's what the, the second definition makes explicit. A, a pre-stability condition is a pair sigma equal z comma p. Where now p is this fine slicing that I tried to sketch over there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right, so where um, right, so p of phi d is a full subcategory for all phi in R with the following property so that um, i of phi plus one is just the shift of p of phi. There are no morphisms from um, semi going from p of phi one to p of phi two if phi one is bigger than phi two, right? And so these will be called the semi-stable semi-stable objects objects of phase phi. So this is the harm vanishing that we saw before. Then for all, again, there's a filtration. There is a sequence of maps, a sequence of um, triangles. Right, so there's a sequence of maps like this so that if I complete each map to a triangle by forming the cone, then these cones are um, semi-stable of decreasing phases. And... Um, Right, so far these are, these are all just conditions on P. And then again, Z is a map from the K group of D to C, a group homomorphism. And the only thing that holds these together is that um, if I have a semi-stable object, then the central charge of that object is in the ray corresponding to the phase phi. Right, so basically these, what I, what I sketch here as vertical strips, these become these rays in the complex plane in the, in the C-stability picture. Why not? The, the proposition is that um, Definition one and two are equivalent. And I, I won't prove this, but let me just say how to go from one to the other. Right, so if I'm given this, this construction that we've already, I mean, of this construction, of course, we implicitly have already seen examples of by my lecture yesterday. Well, for this you said, 
for phi phi in zero one, you said P of phi to be the C semi-stable objects of A. and phase phi, and uh, p of phi plus n is then forced to be p of phi shifted by n for n in z. Right? So this defines p of phi for all real numbers. And conversely, how to go from 2 to 1? Now you have this phi infiltration, and somehow how do you get A? Well, you make this filtration coarser, right? So you said A to be, um, so let me use this notation, P of this interval from zero to one, right? So what I mean by this, I take all the P of phi's, so that phi is in zero one, and then I take the extension closure, so I think I've, Or, or equivalently, I take all the E's so that all the hadron zimmern filtration factor, right, by which I mean these objects AI, all HN factors have phase in, in 0, 1, in this semi-closed interval. Okay, and again, if you, if you actually want to prove that these two uh, notions are equivalent, you need, to, you need to play with the octahedral exon, right? You take, so for example, I mean, let's say you want to go from one to two, you have this cause filtration into cohomology objects, and for each cohomology object, you have the hadron zimmern filtration, and then you have to piece these together to a final filtration of all of E, and um, for that you need the the octahedral axon. Okay, any any questions? And, and, and actually, let me point out one more thing that, right, if you now let, what is the corresponding d less than or equal to zero? This is actually p of zero to plus infinity. Right, so there's, and d greater or equal to zero, this becomes p from minus infinity to one. Right, where these notations are both interpreted in, in the sense over here. It's so again, there's this a bit un unfortunate but really unavoidable clash of notation that here we look at the less than or equal to zero and really this looks like P of greater than zero. But that's just because when people invented T-structures and when people invented slope stability, they used um, opposite signs for analogous behavior. Questions? Okay, and I mean, why do we, why do we, why do I insist on giving both definitions? Because somehow, I mean, this definition is the easier one to use if you actually want to construct them, right? In fact, that's how I actually already have constructed um, stability condition. If you, if you go from the two construction of slope stability yesterday, but somehow, I mean, this is better at exhibiting the symmetry, right? So for example, if you, um, if you rotate the central charge a little bit, then this corresponds to adding something to all the phases, and so there you get an action by the rotation group of um, C, or rather the universal cover, and that's harder to see over here. So, so it's really worth having both, both definition in mind all the time. Okay, and so I mean, I've, I've advertised that by going to the, 
to the derived category, I will get strong deformation properties. But before we can do that, one more ingredient is missing, and let me, so let me, let me motivate this. Right, so what I'll explain now is what's called the um, support property. So, first, um, let's always fix a finite rank lattice Um, lambda together with something like a churn character from the K group to lambda. Right, so, and then, then we only consider central charters that factor by this week. Um, So you have k of x, and this goes via v to lambda. And I only want to consider group homomorphism from k of x to c that factor via this map. And by abuse of notation, I'll now write z for, I'll often write z for this map here over on the right. Uh, k of d, sorry, k of d. Right. Right, and um, the, the examples you should have in mind is that I implicitly used this already. So in this example A, that X is a smooth projective curve. Then I said lambda equal to Z2. And we, if I have an object in the derived category, I just send it to rank of E and degree of E. Right, so of course the K group of, a, of an algebraic curve of positive genus is much bigger than that, but somehow I'm only interested in central charges that, for example, don't distinguish between different skyscraper sheaf of points. And that's, I mean, that will also be important for, I mean, on the one hand, this means somehow that my problem becomes more finer dimensional, on the other hand, it's also important for moduli spaces later. And then in the second example, when you have Q-reps, then um, I said lambda to be just a free abelian group generated by um, one element for, e, for each vertex. And V of V is just the dimension vector. Right, again, if, you, if, if, your quiver has, if your quiver has cycles, then the K group of, is, can actually be much bigger than that, but it always has this map just to the dimension vector. Right, and now we want, the goal is we want a notion of stability of stability conditions such that um, sigma equals ZP or ZA deforms along with with any small deformation of um, Z in what's now a finite dimensional vector space from lambda to Z. Right, so, I mean, we, we, we saw this already in this quiver example. Whenever def I deform my central chart a little bit by deforming my ZIs, then I can deform the notion of stability as, as long, at least as long as they stay in the upper half plane. And this is the phenomenon we want to generalize.
And so let's... Before we try to do this, let's, let's add a bit of thoughts on that. So, there's actually a natural topology on the set of pre-stability conditions. So maybe let me write this as pre-step lambda. Namely, it's the um, coarsest topology such that the following functions are continuous. Right, so first you have this map from three step of lambda to home from lambda to C that just assigns that forgets P and just remembers this, um, this linear data. But then also, there's a very natural notion of um, topology on this, set of, um, of, on this set of possible P's called slicing. Namely, so for each E, um, there are two functions that send sigma, that send C of P to um, phi plus of E and phi minus of E, which are the maximal or minimal phases appearing in the Harrow Zimmern filtration. In Right, so I mean, and of course, some of the Harron Zimmern filtration of E itself may change because objects may become unstable and so on, but at least the maximum and minimal phases appearing, they should depend continuously on the stability condition. Right, and then from this, it follows that being um, semi stable is a closed property. Right, because semi-stable is equivalent to phi plus being equal to phi minus. And so being stable should be an open property. And right, so if you have something that's stable, it should still be stable after small deformations. And let's think about what this implies for our central charge. I'd note that if, if E is stable, then clearly, I mean, V of E cannot be contained in the kernel of the central charge because any stable object is in one of these rays. So, or if you go via the definition one, if um, E is stable, then one of its shift is in A, and so it, the central charge can never be zero. Right, and so, so somewhere here you have the kernel of C, so this is now a picture inside um, lambda R. Right, and so if all these properties should hold, right, so this goal, if the goal holds, and this last property here should hold, and not in, not in kernel, right, this still has to hold hold after small deformations of C. Right, so in other words, there must be a cone around the kernel Z that does not contain V of E for all the stable objects, right? So here, this is V of stable objects must be outside 
This, there must be a cone like this so that V of stable objects are, are outside of this cone and the kernel is inside this cone. Right? And so that's, the, that's exactly the definition of the power property. Right? So definition, um, the pre-stability condition Satisfies the support property, um, sigma equals. Satisfies support property if there exists a there is a quadratic form. Q from lambda tensor R to R, such that if E is semi-stable, then Q of V of E is greater or equal to zero. Right, so I think of this cone being, this cone can be defined by a quadratic form. And on the outside, we have the semi-stables and Q restricted to the kernel is negative definite. Okay, so that's, that's the support property and what I'll show, I mean, what I hopefully try to convey to you today that the support property is necessary if you want to have any hope of nice deformation property for stability condition. And what I'll show tomorrow is that it's also sufficient. So if you take the set of stability conditions, pre-stability conditions satisfying support property, then you get a complex manifold. And this, this, this goal that I formulated over the, there holds. Okay, thank you.